Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the latest Emerging Technologies and Automation Speaker Series webinar. Uh, my name is Wendy Stark and I'm the Director of Business Retention and Expansion at Invest Windsor Essex. This afternoon we will be learning about how data, analyst, data analytics and rapid prototyping can help your business. We will also learn about programs and services available through St. Clair College and Lambton College that can help your company accomplish its goals of becoming more efficient, productive, and quickly bringing new products and technologies to market. Joining me to introduce one of our speakers is Vladimir Franjo. Vlad is the local technology advisor for the National Research Council's Industrial Research Assistance Program, and he was the connection to Lambton College for their presentation on rapid prototyping. Uh, just before we start, I wanna let everyone know that we will be opening up the Q&A box. So if you have any questions as we go along, please put them in the box and we will do our best to get all of them answered. And uh, now I'd like to turn it over to Vlad Franjo from NRC IRA for the introduction to our first speaker, Joel Hodgson from Lanson College. Thank you, Wendy, and welcome everyone. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to continue with the speaker series, uh, uh, part of uh, our Emergence Technologies uh, in Automation uh, conference that we adopted during the pandemic. <clears throat> Uh, it's uh, certainly I had a pleasure of uh, visiting uh, Lambton uh, Manufacturing Innovation Center two years ago when we traveled a lot more. Uh, I would certainly highly recommend if you're around Sarnia to uh, arrange a visit and, and see uh, see what uh, sort of resources labs that they have. Uh, very impressive. Uh, it's also a technology access center. Uh, very active uh, working with companies and, and both presentations will just show you how you can engage with colleges, not just by hiring their grads, uh, you can also engage on, on developing, doing R&D and, and engaging with students uh, before they graduate. Uh, without further ado, uh, and also this is sort of a speaker series uh, that's kind of uh, uh, leads to our main event on, on October 26th, it's the main conference, it will be virtual this year. Uh, that uh, hopefully you will get to, uh, we will see you there too. Uh, I'd like to introduce now uh, Joel Hodgson, who, who is a manager at uh, Lambton Manufacturing Innovation Center, who will tell you all about it. Joel. Thank you, Vlad. Uh, thank you for the introduction and uh, for everyone for kind of inviting me over uh, to, to speak about Lambton College called the College of Applied Research and how we can, can support and rapid prototyping and digital te uh, technology integration. Um, so I'll share my screen here. Um, so um, I guess I'll, I'll give a little bit of a high level kind of history to uh, Lambton College, um, College, College Applied Research, um, and then kind of get into the, the, the crux of uh, the presentation here today. And that's um, technology development, rapid prototyping, and digital integration. So um, here's what we'll be talking about. Um, what are the drivers of technology development, the opportunities? What specific areas are we seeing um, at Lambton College for rapid prototyping and digital integration? To, um, how to that development process works? Um, we're uh, kind of what goes hand in hand with that is the training side. Um, then we'll go through an example, both on the process side and the product side. Um, and then uh, just kind of to wrap it up, uh, the kind of the, the resources available that uh, in the innovation ecosystem um, with the colleges, I'll speak specifically to Lambton College, uh, NRC, and then NSERP as well. So um, what are the drivers in technology development? That's uh, so at Lambton College, we have a few research centers, one of them being the Lambton Manufacturing Innovation Center. So what are we seeing as the drivers? Um, so the big thing being accessibility to advanced technologies. So now more than ever, everybody is able to actually operate in this environment um, and it's more readily available. Um, increased consumer and industry expectations. Um, it's no longer a um, nice to have, it's a requirement for digital technology and advanced technologies to, to be integrated into all products and offerings. Um, uh, a big driver for everything that a, a business does is um, government regulation on safety, information technology, security, and uh, more prevalent is environmental protection. So how we can actually build these technologies to, to achieve those goals and then increase national and international competition. 
Um, so what are the opportunities that come from those drivers? Um, so using these technologies to lower operational costs, product di differentiation, upsell, increase efficiency, increase quality control of data collection, and then always safety. That's a, that's a big uh, thing we've seen as a through line with all the products that we've helped uh, um, companies uh, develop through the years. Um, so those are kind of what we've seen uh, with our research group um, as the uh, drivers and the opportunities. Um, and then getting into those specific sectors. So um, at Lambton College um, and the Lambton Manufacturing Innovation Centers, there's areas of advancement that we've seen on rapid prototyping digital technologies. And it's not traditional additive manufacturing all the time and developing that widget and then entering it into the market. Um, as many of you uh, have very distinct business models and you have a specific customer base um, that you're trying to achieve and you're an expert in, um, you might not have a, an expertise around all these areas, but it's uh, kind of being able to tap into these different areas to, to, to support your business. Um, advanced materials, added manufacturing, uh, automation, instrumentation controls, design and scanning, energy production and storage, which is uh, we found as a very interesting one as of late because it's uh, as we're trying to make products more, uh, more mobile, um, smaller and more accessible, um, lighter weight means being less stress on an employee. Uh, it can mean uh, more energy and efficiency um, in a product line. Um, so being able to shrink the battery size or uh, have something go on a longer charge um, can really change the game for a business. Internet of things, being able to integrate those, um, the internet into your product so that you're able to do data acquisition. Um, product and process simulation. Um, so when, as you're going through that rapid prototyping phase, being able to first, before you actually have to fully invest in a prototype, being able to simulate. And then machine learning and artificial intelligence has really changed uh, the way businesses are um, serving their customers. And then robotics. Um, I think a lot of people have a very traditional view, at least are the customers we deal with on robotics and that it's it's only being meant for large manufacturers in the auto sector or in the large manufacturers um, across different areas. But we're really seeing that the, the cost point has come down on robotics and it's being used in more specialty applications where they, the importance is um, consistency and quality um, and uh, really being able to replicate that process time in and out. Um, so technology implementation and development. So what are the considerations? So this is what, the first questions I ask when uh, an industrial partner kind of walks through our doors or for the past two years has been a Zoom meeting like this is um, we have that conversation is what is your end goal for development of the new product process or service? Because you may have a end goal and you might have a specific idea of how, what you want to use to integrate it. But uh, in kind of the research world, we write a proposal uh, I don't know if we've ever done exactly what we've written in our proposal, but we are always are working to get our customers to that end goal. So we want to have that a conversation of this is where you want to be. This is the technology we want to use to get there. But as the research goes, there's going to be changes in the process. There's going to be new discoveries um, that happen. The big second question is what's your timeline for implementation or development? That can change the scope of the project considerably. The amount of resources that you might need to require or the expectations that your customers should have on when rollout is. Um, and then do you have the internal or external resources for development? Um, so is there somebody in-house that's gonna be able to actually access and develop the technology and then implement it? Or is that gonna be a third party that you work with? And that goes from personnel to equipment or even process. Um, we work with a lot of small and medium-sized enterprises at the Lampton Manufacturing Innovation Center. And one thing we, work with our companies on is not only um, helping them reach their end goal, but also supporting them in understanding what the process for research and development looks like and how to actually replicate that process down the line. So it's it's a not just a um, research relationship, but really a training relationship as well. Um, big question we like to ask is, who's your end user? And do they have the expertise to use this technology if not, how do we make it accessible or how do we train that end user up to be able to use it effectively? Um, and then uh, another big question is, 
do you have the expertise to support the new technology? It's one thing to develop and get into the into your your facility or your partner's hands, but it's another thing to be able to have the support infrastructure. So when they come back, you're able to either add further value or support if there is any issue moving forward. Um, all this kind of lumps into what's a, a big gap because if the technology is not accessible, it's not gonna meet the end goal for either yourself internally or your external partners. Um, so the question we ask is, what are the training gaps for you and your customers? And how can we leverage the resources within your co uh, company or the colleges like St. Clair or Lambton to fill in that uh, gap within the existing training ecosystem? Um, so I'll walk you through a couple of examples and where we can see um, digital technology and rapid prototyping kind of work through both a process and a product example. So I'll start with process. So we worked with a uh, Hamilton-based company called uh, Metallurgical Sensors or Metson, um, where they were supporting the steel industry um, on uh, slag detection, um, hydraulic weighing systems. And our role was to uh, develop software with them to integrate uh, new technologies and sensors and RFID technology for to track um, their uh, steel rollers. This is a very important um, component for the steel uh, manufacturing industry and their work roles um, as tracking them, doing preventative maintenance, doing preventative switching um, and a replacement um, because obviously downtime is a huge, huge issue for them. Um, so this was kind of integrating a new technology, which was uh, really building a software from uh, ground up, but also working with the team so that they were gonna be able to integrate it into these facilities. And then the facilities themselves were actually gonna be able to operate it. Um, these, it was quite easy for our team to go in, develop the software, what wasn't, which always ends up being the most difficult thing is making it accessible for the end user, making sure that it's color coded properly, that it's an easier user interface and that it's also robust. Um, so that when, if somebody is in the system using it and is, may not be an expert in that field or very tech savvy, that they're not gonna be able to go in and uh, break things or, um, kind of get lost within the system. They're gonna be able to find their way back to the where they need to be, utilize the information that's in front of them and then kind of use it in the best light. Um, moving over to a product example. So kind of switching gears, uh, we worked with a Sarnia based company called uh, Vita Gardens um, to develop a countertop micro green um, prototype. Um, so when we, kind of looked at this project, we looked at the technologies and the prototyping process we had have to go through. And we quickly realized that not only is, are we gonna to need to do a design, um, are we gonna to need to have some instrumentation and controls? We're also gonna need our bio-industrial team um, because it has a bio application and making sure that the plants and the microgreens that are gonna be in it are gonna be able to grow to the certain specifications required. We're also gonna need our information technology team to come in and actually um, look at the system that's gonna operate it. Um, and having those three teams work together through the year long project to come to that final stage of prototype was essential with the partner to make sure that when they're going through future prototyping and they're moving on, they understand where that base knowledge came from and what the process should look like. So I'll get into kind of uh, Lambton College here. Um, who we are, where we are, all kind of, and explain what I view as uh, kind of the emerging trends and how we're taking technology, implementing them into existing products, processes, and services, and how we're, our, we're, our mandate kind of supports that in the innovation ecosystem. So Lambton College is located in Sarnia Lambton, so just a, a short drive from uh, Windsor um, at the base of Lake Huron. Um, we Although we're a very small college and a small community, we do have invested a lot in our research and innovation department. Um, so as listed, we're currently in the top three research colleges in Canada. 
and we've been sitting there for this is um, it says four years, but we're just hit our fifth year in the top three in Canada. Um, we do over 200 projects a year. Uh, we have over 200 staff contracts, over 200, um, close to 300 students that get involved and get those real working and learning experiences with customers. Um, and the reason that we kind of made a full investment in this is because of the innovation uh, gap that was kind of in Sarnia Linton. Um, back in the early 2000s, there was kind of an exodus of R&D from uh, uh, a bunch of our major industries. So the college um, came in to kind of fill that gap. And the way we tried to, to come in and fill it was with our, uh, our, our approach of economic, social, and environmental impact. That's, a, that's our mandate. That's our goal. But how we do that is we're going to do research hands-on with uh, each of our industrial partners. Um, for us to have a project, we must have an industrial partner. Kind of um, what a lot of people traditionally would view as research is very fundamental, cutting edge technology development, where we're more on the application side. So how we're going to take a te an existing technology or a very close to commercializable technology, develop it so that the partner can then take it, uh, implement it, um, and then commercialize it and then create that economic, social, and environmental impact in their communities. Um, how we do that is uh, through our partnership model, which is the private sector, uh, our faculty and students, which we use uh, faculty as research expertise. We also have full-time staff researchers uh, that work on projects and then always our students. We always wanna make sure our students are getting those opportunities to work with industry because it's a great learning experience. Everything we do is community driven. We wanna make sure that we're supporting our regional needs. Um, the college provides support, funding agencies, which act, um, identified that for us to innovate as a, as, a, um, as a country, we need to leverage some of those risks um, that companies are going to take. So the grant funding and resources available to support them through the process. And then academic institutions and other associations that uh, support the, the model. So Lampton College Research Innovation is broken down, down into six research centers. Bioindustrial Process Research Center, uh, Information Technology, Energy Research, uh, Materials, Water, and Manufacturing. Uh, we break it down into six, but uh, as I kind of explained, it's very rare for one of these centers to take a project to do it full to completion without uh, integrating with another group. Um, a lot of the, the research that's done, and uh, I'm sure everyone here can kind of attest to it in their own businesses, you need a wide array of expertise for any project. And, Having the ability to integrate these groups uh, to provide a comprehensive solution has been very advantageous for our, our clients. Um, so I talked kind of about that innovation ecosystem. So I'll go through kind of how we work with a couple of our different partners and how they're structured to give you an idea of uh, how we can support projects moving forward. Um, a big partner for us is, uh, as Vlad mentioned, is the National Research Council of Canada, NRC, the IROP program. So we work closely with uh, industrial technology advisors to uh, support their clients and then actually refer our clients to, to their resources as well to, to really uh, leverage all the, the expertise that's out there. Um, and we do that on a uh, local, regional and national level. Um, and the, the way we do that on a project standpoint is through the interactive visit program. So this was a collaboration between technology access um, Canada and NRC IROP and uh, NSERC who supports the tech uh, access centers. Um, so the, um, the interactive visit program allows for up to 20 hours of access to equipment, facilities, and expertise at each of the technology access centers to solve a specific uh, business challenge. Um, so that can be very, very broad, and it's really a conversation between the ITA and the company about what's your challenge, how can the, the tax support that group, uh, that uh, challenge, and then uh, move it towards uh, being overcome. Uh, another major uh, supporter of uh, college applied research across Canada is the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council, so NSERC, um, whose mandate from the federal government is to support colleges in achieving applied research. Um, they support through funding, um, I, I kind of listed one example here, but uh, 
I talked about that leverage and risk mitigation, and that's a good part of what NSERC and NRC3 Interactive Visit Program is doing. So it's, um, you can do anywhere from six months up to a three-year project, varying in uh, size and uh, a scope, um, really to work with the private sector to overcome their challenges um, across research areas. So I, I would encourage anybody that uh, does have those challenges and those pain points, or they're, they're looking at expanding their existing line or optimizing a process to, to look at the colleges as a real resource um, and uh, a way to push their company forward um, through rapid prototyping and digital integration. Um, because it's not just um, about next year, it's thinking longer term and the expectation of what the customers are gonna have and what industry is gonna have moving forward. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for the, the time to, today to uh, kind of present on what College Applied Research is and uh, what Lincoln College is kind of doing uh, down in Sarnia Lampton. Um, and uh, thank you. Thank you, Joel. Uh, if you have questions, uh, put them in. Uh, there is a Q&A button on the bottom. Uh, you can type them in there. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll pass them. I'll read them. Uh, and so uh, I, I do have a few questions uh, for Joel. Uh, like we have a lot of mold makers, automation companies here. And a lot of companies do have 3D printers, that smaller ones on, on the desktop. Uh, but when I visited your your uh, your lab, uh, you have much larger printers, uh, uh, multi multi material uh, capabilities. Uh, if you can just say a few words on, on that, uh, uh, thank you. Yeah. So um, at the college, we have uh, a few different printers. One, we have a laser sintering, which is um, a, a bit smaller scale, but very very accurate for uh, certain types of prototypes. And then we have a larger scale printer, which does a meter and a half by half meter um, by half meter uh, dimension. And that's a multi-material. Um, so uh, there's over 50 different types of uh, materials that can be used on it. Um, and one thing we're, we're working on, and this is kind of when we talk about environmental or advanced materials, is um, with our material processing and our material testing facility, is integrating those two groups so that we're actually developing prototypes uh, with the customer in the material that, of their choice, um, or that's gonna be actually integrated into the product because I know that's a big limitation with 3D printing. So working in the process development for uh, the material and then the process development for how to actually print it and extrude it. Yeah, and I also recall seeing an extruder there, an older one, but still operating. So if, if anyone's developing yeah. materials and a lot of lot of companies around here in plastics, uh, either on the mold making side or or molding, so that that's yet another uh, opportunity if if something needs to be extruded. So that. Uh, uh, on uh, now a few questions on uh, IRAP can help with 20 hours. And again, that includes printing. Like if you need to print a part uh, and, and there's, uh, I can tell you it's a very minimal paperwork. Uh, proposal is not long, it's easy. And then it can continue into answer. Uh, if you can, Joel, just describe that because a lot of IRAP interactive visits continue with answer engage or, or other, if the project turns out to be larger. Yeah, I can speak to the material side. So how something might work is that um, we work with companies on say on an interactive visit where it's an investigation of the material. So characterization or initial testing through our material testing facility. And then it gets to the point where, okay, we know what this is. We, we know how are the physical properties that we need to change for it, but that's not gonna be all done in 20 hours. Maybe that initial characterization and testing will be, okay, now let's grow it out. And that's kind of why I structured it NRC then answer is because it is a growth pattern. And that's, I think, how the innovation ecosystem works is everyone has their part to play and the programs kind of feed into each other. Um, so that could turn into a formulation project um, where you're ent entering into trying to add new additives or you're looking at using recycled materials or you're, you're looking at uh, biomaterials, which is a, a kind of a big thing that we've seen. And a lot of that's getting driven by those external factors of uh, 
environmental new environmental regulations that uh, people are seeing five ten years out. Excellent. And you know, just for an example, uh, last year, like how many of those projects you had? I know you have a summary uh, in, in millions, uh, but I, I, I I've seen a lot a lot more examples there. That's why some numbers likely impressive. Yes, yeah, so we uh, do over 200 projects a year. Um, they're really across the this, um, the different six different centers we have. But the, uh, we have six different centers, but it's really one big group that's integrating and working on uh, to provide that comprehensive solution. We work with partners. Um, I included one from Sarnia Land, and uh, which we love. Um, but from we have partners in one year. We have partners kind of across the country, um, and we're. I like to, to, to encourage people, um, you have a question, you have a problem, or you see a trend, let us know, because the more information we have, whether we can help or point you to somebody who can help, because we try and be tapped in. Um, it also provides us um, the knowledge of where we should be going. Um, so uh, that, that would be my stress is even if uh, you don't look at this presentation and say, hey, that fits perfectly with what I do, reach out, we can have a conversation. and. Um, where your business is going and maybe somebody we can pass you on to help or uh, something we can look at adding for capacity. And, you know, one, I would say last question because we kind of, we are running out of time. Uh, technology access centers, just a few words on what those are. And, you know, yeah. what, what does yes. That mean? <laughs> so lots of acronyms that I went through. Um, one of them being tech, tech, technology access centers. Um, they're a, um, NSERC funded um, research center with a specific focus. So um, we have two technology access centers at Lambton College, one being uh, Lambton Manufacturing, which is focused on advanced manufacturing, the other being bioindustrial processes, which is a little self-explanatory. And our mandate is to um, even kind of further than the college system is work with companies on training technical services and applied research projects to help them grow their businesses. Um, so it's kind of that one, hopefully that uh, there's 60 across Canada um, and really help those companies in whatever area they need um, to get connected with the network so that they can grow their businesses and uh, move forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joel. Great presentation. And uh, if you need more information, feel free to contact Joel. Uh, if you're also looking for IRAP connections, contact me. Either way, we'll, uh, we'll make you connected. Uh, and uh, at this point, I'd like to turn uh, the microphone back to Wendy for, for our next intro. Thanks, Joel, again. <laughs> Great. Uh, thanks very much, Joel and Vlad. Awesome presentation. Um, I'm now very pleased to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Manjari Maheshwari. Manjari is a professor at St. Clair College, teaching in the areas of data analytics, marketing and supply chain management. She holds a PhD and an MBA in management information systems. Audrey worked for Ford Motor Company as an enterprise architect for several years before joining the Zuckerman School of Business at St. Clair College, where she helped um, in creating its popular business data analytics graduate certificate program. Audrey has more than 25 years of practice and academic experience across a wide variety of disciplines, including marketing, supply chain management, enterprise systems, platforms, and program and curriculum development. And she will be speaking to us about whether we need the data we have and do we have the data we need from a manufacturing perspective. Over to you, Mark Manjari. Hello, everyone. You can see my screen, Wendy? Yes, we can see it. Okay, good. Thank you, Wendy, for that introduction and giving me the opportunity to speak directly to businesses. Hopefully, they go home today with some takeaways they can work on. So let's get going. Hello, everyone. Hope all of you are uh, doing well and keeping yourself COVID safe and data safe. My name is Manjri, and today I'll be talking about where we stand in terms of our data needs. And when I say we, I'm referring to the Canadian manufacturing sector. I'll actually share some insights from a report. Uh, are Canadian manufacturers ready? What does an ideal state look like in Industry 4.0? 
and what is currently happening in the, in the manufacturing world in that regards. Before we begin, let's set the stage by briefly talking about you know, the term industry 4.0 and what we know about it. I came across some of these uh, you know, famous quotes which I feel are relevant in the Canadian manufacturing space. So I'm just gonna put them out here. If you just look at the first one, right, the only success of industry 4.0 is that it's on everyone's lips. And that's true because we do hear and talk about it a lot. So there is a lot of awareness around it, which itself can be considered as a success, but now because after awareness action may follow, right? And I say may, and most of you will agree that it's not easy to realize 4.0, right? So the second quote is more the reality, right? That which is our current state. Some may be ahead and some may be behind, but, and I have some numbers to share that, but really that's what reality is to most of us. And so moving on to the third one, you know, so, so whatever you call it, right? Whether you call it industry 4.0, which is more a European, you know, term led by Germany or the industrial internet of things or smart factory, which is more uh, North American based led by USA or business as usual, right? It is just impossible to avoid it. We all know that, right? So, so what is industry 4.0, right? If I ask that question, it's an umbrella term for the current phase of industrial revolution, which integrates your cyber physical systems and the internet of things into production line and manufacturing. The, these systems are intelligent, or I should say they become intelligent over time. And what is fueling this intelligence is your internet of things, cloud technology, and big data, right? We've all aware of how manufacturing has progressed over decades and the latest progress or the fourth revolution is where the emergence of cyber physical systems come into play. And they leverage off of what has already been done in the space in terms of automation and you know, that's been, you know, part of your industry 3.0, but it's the highly instrumented wireless sensors that have come into play, right? So data collection via those sensors, then doing analytics on it, machine learning, AI, that's what is transforming the business in the manufacturing world. And there's industry 4.0 work groups that have that has been formed and various other consortium that, has, that exist out there. So sensors are collecting information Think of them as devices, right? Having IP addresses that can be connected via internet. And sometimes they go directly to the cloud to the data that's collected. You can monitor that activity and then you can share that information in ways that you haven't been able to do it before. There's a lot more sensitivity around a build to demand versus, you know, opposed to build to inventory. Because if you have data, you can do those kind of things. And when you have lots of relevant data that's available. Machine learning models can be built and prediction can be made for the future, right? And cloud technologies have gained enormous uh, popularity in the last few years uh, from an MLAI pers perspective too. With minimum infrastructure cost, company can leverage the benefits uh, in the cloud. Of course, there are challenges like with any other technology adoption, but at least it has opened the door for many small, medium-sized enterprises. So the ability to collect information, the ability to share information, and then the ability to use that information to make better informed decisions and be more productive and be able to take those decisions in a more decentralized way. Um, you know, is the key for industry 4.0. But that's really, you know, we talk about it, but what is really the ideal state of industry 4.0 and how would it look before we move on to what the current state is, right? So an ideal state, real, so again, realizing industry 4.0 is not easy. It's a complicated, uh, you know, integration of your operational technology and your information technology. Anyone who's gone through any digital transformation of any sort or automation knows that it's not just a click, rather it's a process or a journey that organizations have to commit to before they start reaping those benefits of incorporating data into their daily decision making, right, in a meaningful and productive way. So, and data needs for industry 4.0 zero are huge, right? The spectrum of, and the spectrum of use cases uh, can range from simple 
to complex. You can get value by moving in, in the direction of industry 4.0 incrementally with the simple cases. And the easiest use case to monitor would be just monitor machine data in real time. Well, so what is real-time machine data? I mean, you know, being in manufacturing sector, most of you would know, right? Data delivered immediately after collection to uh, IT or a cloud or any other system that you're using, like the error data, production values, sensor values, et cetera. And then the availability of huge quantities of real-time data and information enables a better understanding of how things relate to each other and provide a basis for fast, faster decision-making. Without real-time machine data, you have more and longer downtimes and no insights to optimize those machine processes. Then remote monitoring will follow, right? Once you start collecting the data, data from the shop floor all the way to wherever you are to any device you want to see at any time. For example, right, many of, of us like to play golf in summer months, right? You could be playing golf and monitoring your machines on your mobile device or a watch. Or, I mean, I'm just sharing this example because recently I came across that I was on a golf course. By the way, I'm not, I'm a very new golfer. So I was on a golf course and I was playing with this uh, person and con continuously looking at uh, his watch, I mean, monitoring the machine. So that's something possible now. A set utilization, again, uh, is the number one prior. It should be you know, number one priority for all manufacturers. And if we talk about machine as an asset, then if you're thinking of where to begin in this journey of Industry 4.0, this would be a good place to start for a data analytics project, right? Best practices for manage, managing yield include regular preventative maintenance to ensure equipment runs and operates smoothly, managing tooling to ensure the right tools are ready and available and masters the data accuracy around it, right? Which leads to the whole notion of predictive maintenance, which we hear a lot, but it doesn't happen right away, right? There's a whole process that it has to go through. So it, this is an advanced form of maintenance that's based on data. The data provides insight into the performance and health of the equipment, giving maintenance teams a better understanding of what equipment needs to be serviced and implementing predictive maintenance does reduce um, you know, unplanned downtime. And then uh, for unplanned downtime can also point out concerns about tooling, maintenance, inventory management processes and the skills or availability of the setup group. So you know, there's a chain, right? nothing works in isolation here. Then we can also talk about this whole idea of digital twins, right? Again, this concept is not new, but it has become easy to implement because of industrial uh, IoT. Digital twinning, uh, the scale is much larger and it can happen now and the benefits it can provide is also huge. So what is it? It's basically a computer program that takes real world data about a physical object or a system as input and produces as outputs or simulations of how that physical object or system will be affected by those inputs, right? So you can run simulations as well before even actually devices are built. Previously, any initiative would finish and then you would be able to get that data and then look at it. But now with these new digital technologies like augmented reality and digital twins, you're able to get that set up uh, virtual environment in real time before you actually dedicate resources to deploying them in real world. So there's lots of you know, good use cases. And then of course your, uh, you know, your end uh, goal is really the, or the ultimate desired outcome is implementing an industry 4.0 solution with end-to-end -end supply chain visibility. To achieve this, again, it's not a one solution, right? You have to progress it through the journey and I can't emphasize that enough. The more data visibility there is, the more end-to-end -end supply chain vis visibility there will be, right? And it doesn't happen overnight. So let's look at the next uh, slide here. It's again, uh, a very generic example of a, a data pipeline. So how does it all work in the data world, right? Raw material, which is the data in our, this case, right? It comes in from various sources. Think of them as suppliers of data, your different machines and, right, and your existing database that you have. So first step is your data execution acquisition from machines. And you could do that in many ways, right? We've heard of the term edge computing as well, right? And then logging that into a central deposit, a repository or a 
secure cloud solution. So basically you attach smart components to, to your, your machines or your physical items and then collect the data, transfer it to the cloud in real time. And then you can analyze that data and then um, before cleaning data exploration, data modeling. And so these are just the steps of a data analytics life cycle in a nutshell. And there are a lot of challenges that are ex that exist. It's not like, you know, as simple as it looks, but if you have to start somewhere, you know, you got to pick a small, simple use case and start. And because data is structured in many different ways, right? No machines will have similar data. So, you know, how do you play around with that different protocols that exist out there? So there's a lot, lot more than it looks, but a start can be made, right? And then, so basically, you, this is a proposed data pipeline where you ingest the data, process it, extract some meaningful features and apply machine learning model and then deploy it. So your predictive maintenance example, right? Eventually, if you're able to do that before machine breaks would be when you've collected the data, you've explored it, you've modeled it and you've deployed it, right? So. I'll just move on to the next slide here. Again, just spend a few seconds on this. I don't need to read it, right? You can, so this is self-explanatory, but jokes apart, right? The message is very important to understand here. If you can't collect the data you need, what good that analysis would be? Also, the need comes from your business understanding, your business problem that you're trying to answer. So what is really your goal? We do hear a lot, right? You discover something novel, but it's not that simple, right? Discover something novel. It's not something you do right away. You have to have the setup for that first. Starting has to be still, you know, what your goal is. And then eventually you get into that, that feel that, okay, now we can suddenly discover new things. Right. So next uh, slide is about, so we talked about the ideal state, right? All those use cases, but what really is the current state right now? You know, what type, what is uh, from a, a data availability standpoint? So this is again coming from the report, our Canadian manufacturers ready, some of those numbers that you see. So there is exponential increase in data. We know that there's multiple data sources scattered within the organization across the organization, lots of unstructured data, data becomes stale also very quickly, lots of redundant data because different departments may be collecting, you know, same, same data, data rot means a lot of the old data that's stored on those older, you know, uh, storage devices like tapes, if some of you remember, right, if they do get bad too and there's no way to even uh, you know sometimes read those things data security right it's a big thing and again i'm no expert on data security here but it's a important thing to remember uh, in in the current scenario for most of the issues that um, that are out there and these numbers are again self-explanatory here right these come from that report something to look at the first one right 69 percent of the respondents who responded to the survey way uh, for this uh, study are still collecting data in spreadsheets. And if you look at the last number there, 18% of them are going with sensors. So, and it has improved over time, but there is, you can see a lot of scope there. Right. Again, for continuing from that report, some of the key highlights I want to point out. The first one, lack of, and I think the first speaker uh, talked about that a little bit as, as well, lack of skills and talent to support investment and make technology work for businesses, right? And uh, this has been an ongoing uh, problem, I think, all across. So uh, how, and th this is where the colleges and the educational institutes come in, right? We Can we provide that? what industry needs and difficulties in integrating advanced technology into legacy systems. Again, a, a big, big challenge. If let's assume if we all got Greenfield to work with, how easy it would be. Brownfield has its own challenges and in IT space, it's just uh, enormous. And so where do you begin? A lot of uh, the manufacturers are struggling in their journey where to begin, and it can be overwhelming at times. So that's another uh, challenge that was highlighted. And some of the numbers, again, uh, you know, uh, confirm those challenges. 82% of the respondents believe that these concepts are hard to implement. And uh, I completely agree with that. But 82%, again, 
feel that there's a lot of opportunity for growth. So that's really the plus science. They they want to move in that direction. It's just where to begin and the availability of skills and talent, uh, you know, are some of the barriers. And the the fifth bullet here talks about 1% of respondents reported operations that are primarily machine driven. So that's interesting because, you know, we hear those terms, right, in data analytics, descriptive analytics. So what is currently happening is the descriptive analytics. Predictive is, right, okay, what can we predict for the future? And then the prescriptive really is, so what we have predicting, how can that be put into practice. So, I mean, so again, 1% of them are saying that uh, machines are able to uh, to make uh, decisions for them. So definitely there's a lot of scope out there. And uh, I'm just going to highlight on the data capturing uh, piece there. And so there is uh, a lot of scope and manufacturers do plan to spend on data capturing. So if going slow, taking up few projects at a time would definitely help and, and cloud will play a big role as well. So some of the opportunities that, you know, based on my research that I identified was, of course, technology. Adoption is happening. It's improved, but it's slow. So there's scope there. And some of the things that will fuel that, uh, uh, you know, journey would be dramatic reduction in costs of sensors, computing, network, bandwidth, and storage. And then even the size of sensors have gone down. So that will help. Workforce, there's a lot of opportunities there. There the gaps uh, we all know exist. Workforce demographics is changing. A I mean, lot of our older uh, folks so retiring, younger workforce coming into play. And younger workforce is comfortable with technology, but does that mean they're comfortable with data too? So you may have a technology savvy workforce, but not necessarily a, a data savvy workforce, right? So there is uh, work to be done there. Training, that's where again, uh, you know, educational institutions come in is a training, right? Re so we hear this word of reskilling and upskilling. Both of them, are imply learning new skills. Only thing is context is different. Upskilling primarily focus on helping employees become more skilled and relevant at the same job or the current position, while reskilling is focusing on making employees available for other jobs in the organization. Both are important, plus new hiring is important too, right? Because the current workforce that you have, you can do a lot of upskilling, uh, reskilling, and then hire new workforce as well when, when needed. So, uh, you know, we hear all these job losses happening because of uh, new emerging uh, technologies, right? We hear those different reports, but it does not necessarily mean net job loss as millions of jobs are expected to be created by these new technologies too. So relevant training is needed. So if you can, uh, you know, take your current workforce and do some reskilling, do some upskilling and hire some new workforce because current workforce is very important, right? Employees that have been working for an organization for several years Years, have a deep understanding of company needs, clients, customer partners, right? So even technology is changing at rapid rate. So what, right? Those uh, those employees can be can be reskilled, upskilled too. To to uh, and and there's a the culture of upskilling and reskilling has to uh, to happen. You know that then it brings me to my next opportunity from the management side of things, right? Awareness exists now. It's time to do from awareness to action. That has to happen. And uh, short, uh, you know, success stories have to be celebrated, right? Short stories need to be highlighted. And then the whole culture of, uh, you know, the data-centric culture that has to be you know, initiated in the organization. It can come from top, but sometimes it comes from bottom too. Right. So, so those things, and there's a lot of opportunities there in in our uh, in this sector in our region as well. And from an environmental uh, standpoint, I mean, again, I don't want to say a lot, but we all know sustainability is no longer a choice. And how can data help in that, right? So, if you want to uh, basically be compliant with the environmental, uh, you know, regulations, how much? Uh, uh, exhaust is coming out from your chimneys, for example, right? So uh, then only you will be able to control it and reduce it, right? So, so a lot of data points there that can be, be collected. Again, that was just an example, right? So uh, 
I wanted to bring this because you know we are still in a pandemic. How has pandemic changed the way we think as manufacturers? There's increased adoption of IIOTs that has happened for sure. And that has been fueled because of shift to remote work, the necessities of social distancing and the strain on supply chains. And with that, the increasing push to accomplish more with fewer resources, right? More sensors have been deployed and more data is collected and managed. So things can be done, a lot of things can be done remotely, right? So remote monitoring has increased and there's a gradual shift in the mindset that more can be achieved by keeping minimal staff in a facility. And that pandemic has fueled. Right. So more remote monitoring can be done. And then again, shift away from paper-based transaction to digital transaction. Then we all probably have experienced that in some form or the other, including myself, right? In the last one and a half year, I've hardly printed any paper. Most things have gone digital for me, right? So now the key question here is how can we help? as educational institutions, how can we help? There are many different ways we can help. And we saw the earlier uh, presentation, right? Where, which was from a different uh, perspective, but here uh, I'm gonna uh, talk about just a few things. Uh, one thing is building farm teams. So this concept of farm teams, it comes from the uh, field of sports, right? Where you provide experience and training for young players with an agreement that any successful player can move up to a higher level at any given point, right? Most of these major leagues, uh, sport leagues do that. But can businesses also leverage on that? Businesses, uh, if interested in creating a farm team system, they can get in touch with uh, local uh, you know, colleges and universities and even community-based job training programs within the region and build those teams because then you can have some kind of an internship type of a program within within your uh, you know business enterprise organization and then you can hire uh, the the high or the more successful uh, 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 you know interns directly into your organization the whole idea of reskilling up so you know that can all be be reduced by this so that would be worth uh, you know exploring and then together, right, businesses with the institutions can together identify opportunities. Uh, you know, there's a lot of opportunities from a data analytics program. That's where I teach in at St. Clair College. Course projects are some mini projects that can be undertaken. Then we have a larger project, which we call capstone project, where our students can, uh, you know, uh, help out uh, with uh, businesses and then the scope for internships, which could be a little bit longer, a longer term, uh, you know, once data is collected, what can they do with that data? So going through that whole uh, analytics life cycle, then, uh, you know, university colleges have uh, research uh, uh, centers and departments. So applied research can take place. Right? And then shared data and tech services, which is really, you know, if you have a data set, share it with us, we have the resources, we can analyze it and, and, and give it back to you. So, you know, so we can work closely there. So there's lots of opportunities, some already exist, some, you know, we can build uh, for the future. So I would like to end my presentation with this uh, key takeaway, which is, you know, what is your data journey? So from raw data to deeper insights and each individual data journey will each individual business will have their own data journey right so business understanding is paramount or what is my goal I have can i identify a goal that i can work with so then once you've identified that then you can focus on process of acquiring the data capturing the individual data points connecting them in meaningful ways generating insights to share with others and build stories with words and visuals, which eventually you can use to make informed decisions, which will help you in achieving your identified goal. So I would say if someone in the audience is looking to start, this would be a, a good uh, uh, takeaway to you know, identify one problem, one goal, and then st start working backwards and and then, as I said, right, we are, uh, as uh, educational institutions, uh, you know, we are here to help within our, you know, setting. So with that, I would like to thank everyone for listening uh, patiently and 
open to questions if anyone has any. Thank you so much, Marjorie. That was a, a great presentation. I, I think you know the key thing is is um, you know, where to start and and the pathway that you can follow. I think it's just very difficult and sometimes overwhelming for, a, particularly a smaller company, to to just know where to start in this in this data journey. Um, so, um, as we said earlier, if you have any questions, please throw them in the in the Q and A box. I do have a couple um, that I'd like to pose. We just have a couple of minutes left, but. Um, just uh, wondering, so you did mention about uh, different ways that companies can connect with the college, um, you know, to have some students maybe work on a project for them. What's the timing on that? Like, is there, what is the best time to connect with you, um, depending on what type of project there might be? So, so generally, you know, if I'm just speaking from the data analytics program mm -hmm. uh, point of view, right, winter semester, we run a capstone project. So if someone wants to, so, but to start something in the winter semester, right, the connection has to be made in the fall. Right. Because if you make the connection, because things take time, right? We all understand, right? To get started, you take you need time. So if we can get going in the fall semester, right? To late fall, so student, so which students, you know, which business is interested, which student group is interested in working on a particular problem, then once winter semester starts, they are ready to work on it and they are able to do a much better job because there's, with you know, with programs you have time constraints too, right? If and students have to graduate as well, but internships, which is more, you know, you could do them in the summertime. There's just a little bit more time. And then we have the flexibility, right? Sometimes if we can start as a mini project in a particular course, we have a course on supply chain analytics and then take it further down to make it a bigger course and then more partnerships can be built. So depending on what the interest is in the business community, you know, things can be worked around because we are here to help uh, the businesses achieve their goals from a data and tech standpoint. So, and the more we can help out locally, the better it is for the community and again, better for the students too, right? If they can get that experience of working in real time, it will benefit them also. Right. right. Um, and so from the company's perspective, uh, about uh, can you give us an idea of um, how much in the way of resources they would have to allocate to a project? So if they're working with the college on a project, um, you know, is it typically one person is the point person or like what, what type of manpower would they have to allocate? To so from a business standpoint i would say uh, you know i mean you definitely a contact person should be you know everybody is busy right one person can be the main contact person who can uh, basically guide the students right because students will need some guidance and of course depending and then we have a team of professors at our college too right so depending on who which professor has the bandwidth then they can so we don't necessarily leave the students like right? a professor is always involved with that right so a professor and a few students and then at least one uh, uh, contact person from the business and then again depending on the problem on hand right what is it that we are trying to address if there's more uh, people needed then they can be con con contacted as well so really uh, from a resource standpoint it's the time commitment from some time commitment from the business and then uh, you know, if they have data to share, of course, then they'll have to share that data for with our students. And the, uh, and then if, you know, if there's a need, students need to go on site and all those things have to be arranged. But with data analytics, right, the thing is you could work, you don't have to be on site too, right? So it could, it could be done otherwise too. So depending again on the problem. Okay, uh, we do have one question from uh, from an attendee. Uh, can you give an example of some of the projects or topics in the supply chain analytics course? So, you know, for example, uh, demand forecasting, right? That's a major, uh, you know, uh, things uh, manufacturers undertake, right? So uh, we do projects on demand forecasting, then inventory management, right? We do projects uh, projects on that. So those are just some simple projects to, to start with. So, and then uh, as you know, I was talking about all this, uh, uh, you know, sensors and IIOTs, right? So if we can, we want to get into that field as well, but we don't have, data right now. So that's why we are looking to the industry partners and businesses to provide us with data too. So then we can, you know, go from there. But, you know, some of the topics are demand forecasting, inventory management, and, and those kind of things we teach. 
Okay, great. Okay, so we're, we're, we're out of time. Um, and this is really a couple of great presentations, I think very informative. Um, and we are uh, recording this, so we'll be able to, uh, to put the presentations on our uh, Emerging Technologies website and we'll be able to, uh, to link everybody to those. If anybody has any other questions uh, that they'd rather ask individually, or if something occurs to you later, we'll be following up with an email uh, to all attendees. And again, as I said earlier, we will include the speaker's uh, contact information, including Vlad's as well. So if you have a project that you, you think you know, might be something you want to work on, then you know, you'll have their information to, um, to reach out to them. Uh, so I want to extend uh, a sincere thank you to both of our speakers today. I also want to thank everyone who is able to attend. Um, hopefully everybody has some valuable takeaways and maybe some ideas of how to, about how to work with uh, Lambton College or St. Clair College in the future, uh, helping to provide some, you know, as Marjorie said, some real world training to the future workforce, and at the same time gaining access to facilities and services of these institutions, and in some cases support from upper levels of government as well. And before we close, uh, just as Vlad mentioned earlier, I would like to ask everyone to keep an eye out for an invitation to the Emerging Technologies and Automation Virtual Conference, which is coming up on October 26th. Uh, the conference is held in partnership as always with NRC IRAP and Automation Canada. Um, it's also historically been supported by our, our great local institutions such as St. Clair College and the University of Windsor, among many others. Um, and this will be a virtual event this year, um, but hopefully next year we will see you all in person at Seizures again. Um, you can also please check the emergingtechnologies.ca website. Uh, that will be updated with more conference information, including sponsorship opportunities as it becomes available. Uh, we're very excited to have Jim Beretta from the Robot Industry Podcast as our keynote speaker for the event. Um, so with that, um, thanks again to everyone, and I hope you have all have a great rest of your day.